So tēnā, tēnā katoa, my name's Mark Mitchell. I work for Hawke's Bay Regional Council and the Biosecurity Team. And obviously a few of you missed the memo because I'm about to talk policy. So I'm glad a few of you have stuck around. And one of my main roles at the moment is putting our regional pest management plan together. So what I'll talk to you today about is how we're going to use that as a mechanism for securing long-term investment in predator control. And Steve touched on that right at the end of his talk. So to give you a bit of background info, uh, effectively we're going to use one of our current programs as a, te oh, good catch, as a, as a template. And it's our possum control area program. So this was initiated back in 2000 when bovine tuberculosis was a really big concern in the rural community. And it was the main driver for people wanting possum control to be undertaken. So we had parts of the region that were still TB free, but Hawke's Bay had oodles of possums. Possums love the Hawke's Bay environment. So farmers, they came to the, the council and said, right, we need to do something about this. We want to protect our, our livestock, our, our cattle and deer. From, from tuberculosis, how can you help us? So we went and had a look around the rest of the country and we actually went to Taranaki and stole their model um, and including one of their employees and brought them back to Hawke's Bay and effectively rolled out the possum control program. So how it works is it uses policy. So if you get an area of say around 10,000 hectares and you go, we went to the community, each individual landowner and sat down with them and said, right, would you like to sign up to a possum control program? And we went through that program with each individual landowner, talking about what the requirements would be, how we would go about control, and what that meant for them long term. If we had 75% of that area, land area, sign up, it then became binding in the regional pest management plan. So even for the others, if they didn't sign up, since 75% of that area had signed up, it became binding for everyone. And that was a key part of its success. Once we got that threshold, everyone would get uh, a chance to have their say, but once signed up, contractors were sent in and they'd reduce possums down to 5% or less throughout that entire area. And the contractors did a really, really good job. Uh, most of the area's coming back 1% to 2%, so it set the benchmark. They would also set up an infrastructure, so they'd put bait stations throughout that pit, the, through the farmland, and then that was handed back to the farmers. So it was then the farmer's or the landowner's requirement to manage possums at or below 5%. And the role of the council really became a regulatory role. We'd give them advice and advocacy and lots of prompts and help, and we also subsidised bait. But at the end of the day, we would monitor that area to make sure they were meeting that 5% requirement. And that map on the right-hand side, we've now got the biggest PCA area, Steve, so you might have been the first, but that's 715,000. <laughs> but over 4,000 properties. So, yeah. <laughs> 715,000 hectares. And each little colour on that map is a PCA area. And the green line is the Hawke's Bay region. So it's a large portion of our region now under active possum management. And we do monitoring across that PCA area, and it's coming back an average of 2.3%. So really low possum densities. It's working, it's been in place for 17 years, and the strongest bit about it is the farmers are right behind it. They really support it. So the model has worked really, really well. But it hasn't just been because we've effectively mitigated the risk of TB through the possum uh, as being vectors, or the fact that farmers have got more pasture, or the fact that it's only costing farmers $2 a hectare or less annually to manage these possums. The biggest support we've got from farmers is because of this. They actually saw the biodiversity change in front of their eyes. For those farmers fortunate enough to have some native bush on their land in Hawke's Bay, <laughs> um, they were commenting on they'd never seen the native trees fruit or flower like they've seen them after removing possums. And in turn, we've had really big responses with our native birds. And some really surprising ones too. So bowbirds are a classic, so are Tui. We've had really great success in our urban projects on the Napier Hill. But species like kaka turning up, unbanded kaka. That kaka photo there was taken on Napier Hill, work colleague's house, turned up. This, I, I live 20 minutes from town on a family farm and we've never had New Zealand falcon in our catchment or any, anywhere near us. Now we've got a pair living in our catchment and they're breeding. 
and it's great watching them snot all those little birds like miners and starlings. It's good fun. <laughs> and that, that whitehead, it was taken to my plum tree outside our house. So whiteheads have come all the way back down from the ranges right down to the coast. All we've done is taken out possums. So there is a bit of assumption and some learnings there just because these species might be absent, particularly whiteheads in a farm landscape. It doesn't mean because they can't survive there. It's actually maybe we need to release them from the predators. So the farmers seeing this, they got a real big buzz out of that. So unfortunately, I'll just touch on the national picture. You know, was, biodiversity is still declining. We haven't halted that, let alone reversed it. We've had other people talk quite a bit on this today, so I won't touch in yesterday on it. But I do recommend reading the PCE's report. It's um, Saving New Zealand Birds. It's a really, really, well... It's, it's worth a read, put it that way. But we've got all sorts of other policy things swirling around at the moment, including land and water, all heading down that path of effectively biodiversity. So we're heading in the right direction. So if I zoom into a regional scale now, so predators, you know, they're, they're part of that jigsaw puzzle. So controlling predators will hopefully help turn that trend around. In Hawke's Bay, we do this in multiple ways. One of the ways is site led predator control, and that's, that's your classic. You go to a site where high biodiversity, we go in and remove the pests, usually helping community groups, and then give them advice and advocacy on that point forward. The second stage was moving, walking quite closely with the Department of Conservation, their boundary stream mainland island, Potereo Atane was formed, where they, instead of just focusing on that biodiversity spot, what about if we do a big buffer around that program and try and prevent the pests getting into that site? So that was about 8,500 hectares of farmland surrounding it. And that worked really well, and then Cape to City was born. So Cape to City, a large focus on that is how can we form basically a template and provide the tools to undertake predator control over a very large area, reduce predators down to very low densities, provide the infrastructure for the rural community to then take that on and then manage it so we keep those predators suppressed long term. And those are just a few cats pulled out of those areas. Cats are a significant issue in the rural landscape. So this is Campbell's slide. It's effectively, how do we take our possum control program and the success we've had with that and actually convert it into a predator control program and lock that in? So I'm going to get into some policy stuff now. So for those of you who don't work for a regional council and are unfamiliar with what a regional pest management plan is, it's the main statutory document that regional councils use for implementing our programs under the Biosecurity Act. It gives us the framework that we require for managing and eradicating pests. It's a really important document to us. But it also gives us the powers to get stuff done. So when you get the 5% of people who decide that they don't want to do anything, we can actually go in and get stuff done and do it. And finally, it's locked in for 10 years. So once council sign it off and the community agree to it, and it's locked in, it's locked in for 10 years. So you get a, it gives you um, real clarity on your programs moving forward and the ability... So I guess one, one thing I forgot to mention, sorry, was inclusion by reference. So... This is more for regional councils who are currently going through the original pest management plan process. So councils are going through that right now, and we're looking at locking ours in in the next six months. The issue we have is Cape to City's not quite ready yet. It's probably going to be another one to two years before we re uh, can get the, the knowledge and actually truly understand what it's going to look like for the community and what they're going to be taking on to lock it into a regional pest management plan. So how do we do that? If we're locking it in now for 10 years... What can we put in the Regional Pest Management Plan? Well, inclusion by reference gives us the ability to do this. <coughs> Under the Biosecurity Act, it provides the ability to include, uh, incorporate by reference into the Regional Pest Management Plan. And it also allows you to amend that document. So that's the key bit to it. So we can include a rule that requires landowners to undertake pest control within accordance to the incorporated by reference document, and we can change that. So what we're looking at doing, and what I've written up, is a predator, pe oh, 
a predator control area technical protocol. So I've effectively mirrored the PCA program. So it's the same sign up process. It's the same initial way we do initial control and set up of that maintenance infrastructure. And we'll also have a monitoring protocol. We've been working really close with Al Glenn and we've also got our wireless technology. And we've included a rule in our RPMP that went to council today um, that will bind land occupiers if they sign up to this technical protocol, they've got to achieve that. And that got us thinking, if we can do it for predators, what about eradicating possums? Can we lock that in too? And so effectively that's what I've written up as a possum eradication area technical protocol. Now under our current rules, to be totally frank under the Biosecurity Act, we could probably go on with one of those pimped out mules there on the right hand side and just start blazing guns like the Terminator. But that doesn't take the community along with you. A big point, a part of the success of our possum control program is signing people up. They get it, they understand it, they know what they're signing up to, and they're making that decision. Will I, will, or will I not be part of this? So even if it's possum eradication, signing people up to say, hey, look, we will undertake this if you guys commit to just reporting if you see them, or managing vector pathways such as hay on a truck. So a big part is, although it's policy, it's actually getting the community to sign up and decide, yeah, we want to be part of that, we're going to do it. It puts the onus back on them. And it becomes binding in the RPMP for the few that don't want to achieve it. So in a nutshell, what the Regional Pest Management Plan can be very good at is actually providing a mechanism for locking those programs in. Because there's been significant investment in the past, and rapidly growing right now, in, in pest control. We have a mechanism for locking that in and getting people to commit to make that decision. Do we want it? Yes, we do. We're willing to take on that long-term cost. So by allowing that or using that mechanism, effectively what we can do is say to businesses, ratepayers, or philanthropic providers, if you come in and do one-off investments in our region, such as pay for predators to be reduced down to row densities and pay for the infrastructure, our community are willing to take that on and lock that in the Regional Pest Management Plan. And Hawke's Bay Regional Council will monitor it and work alongside them to make sure we achieve it. That's it. Thank you. Mark, your initial knockdown, um, was that a combination of Animal Health Board TV funding and ratepayers funding, or uh, was it just ratepayers, or was it just Animal Health Board? Or yeah, no, that's a really good point. I should have mentioned that. So that is a combination. So on the map earlier, um, I, and I'll quickly show you that. If, oh, no, it's not going to work anymore, is it? It's all good. Part of that map, you would have seen a very large yellow area, and that's still an active TV management area. Um, I'm just going to flick through. Yep, that map there, is it not? Yep. I can, I can see it. <laughs> yeah, so in the south, it was mainly ratepayers through contractors. But for the northern, uh, middle and northern part, effectively re-rolled off the back of the TB3 Osprey program. So they come in and did all this hard work, and effectively we've just come in behind them and locked that in for, for future. And that yellow area, the rest of it, that's all TB free, it's all actively managed by offspring. So you've only got a very small portion, which is the real Hines car workers up in Te Uruwera's, that is not managed actively for possums. So we're in a really good space right now. And this mechanism has allowed us to lock that in. So all your PCAs and the multicolours there, yep. they're all, that's all ratepayer funded? Oh, from this point onwards, it's all ratepayer funded. Yep. So you're, sorry, your initial knockdown of all that. That was all rate, rate power funded for the well. um, that lower half. The initial knockdown. Well, it's it's really complicated. It's a, it's there were parts that were and there were parts that weren't. So it was, if if it was under active TV management, it was generally quite close to the ranges and whatnot. Yeah. So it's bits and bobs. Yep. 